So if there's something weird and it don't look good, who are you going to call? Um, with our speaker, Francis Malloy. This, is a, this event is organized and sponsored by the Capital New York Alliance for Response and the Capital District Library Council. My name is Karen Kiorpis. I will be your hostess. By way of introductions, I'm the head of preservation at the University at Albany Libraries here in Albany, New York, a position I've held since 2001, and with John Diefenderfer, New York State Library, current co-chair of the Capital New York Alliance for Response. Let me tell you a little bit more about our organization, CAP, New York AFR, um, with a voluntary advisory board of area experts, works to build strong partnerships between cultural stewards and first responders in the capital region to help ensure the protection of our collections. We do this through advocacy, education, networking, and real-time emergency assistance. Organized in 2015, Capital New York AFR is dedicated to serving libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural institutions in the Capital District. Our goal is to improve disaster planning, response, and recovery efforts to minimize loss and damage to our historic sites and valued collections. We are one of more than 20 AFRs across the United States, loosely organized under the Foundation for Advancement in Conservation, part of the American Institute for Conservation. Um, just a couple of etiquette notes before we start. Please keep yourself muted at all times. We invite questions throughout today's program as well as at the end. You can ask your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand located at the bottom of your Zoom screen under reactions. Wait to be recognized so you can ask your question and convert, converse directly with the speaker. Closed captioning, as I noted, has been turned on. Using the toolbar at the bottom of Zoom, you can uh, turn it off or you can turn on live transcript to enhance this accessibility feature. Okay, about our speaker, Frances Malloy is the college librarian for Union College in Schenectady, New York. She has oversight of the Schaefer Library, the Adirondack Research Library, the Mandeville Art Gallery, and the Permanent Art Collection. Frances started working at Union in August 2012 after working at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia and Hamilton College in Clinton, New York. She holds a BA from St. Lawrence University and an MLS from the State University of New York here in Albany. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I am going to mute myself and pass our program over to Frances uh, again, welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, uh, thanks for that kind introduction, Karen. And I'm going to talk about uh, some of the lessons I've learned and the experiences I've had uh, working with insurance companies, dealing with um, some issues. And I'm trying to figure out how to advance my screen here. So bear with me. Oh, oh I see it. There we go. Okay, so again, Karen did a nice job of um, introducing me. But just to reiterate, um, you know, my background is in public services and academic libraries. Um, I don't have a, I never took classes in archives, art, or conservation. Um, so any expertise I have, I've learned on the job. And I am an intellectually curious person. Uh, so I like new challenges. I like learning. And I'm not afraid to pick up the phone and call people and ask stupid questions. And I'm really good at doing Google research. Um, so uh, that's just so you know, like, if I can learn how to do this stuff, anybody can. Um, again, let's see if I can advance my screen. There we go. So <clears throat> when I, I was asked to join the Capital New York AFR when it was first forming back in 2015, and when you hear the word disasters, right, you, you think of things like this, right? This this flood um, where you know the whole the whole library is is um, incapacitated. You know, Fordham Library, the Rose Hill Library, this this fall had four feet of water in their basement. Um, I've never had those kinds of disasters, um, 
But the kinds of disasters I've had are more of the, I'm going to call them the everyday, um, something weird happens, disasters. Uh, so my disasters with a lowercase d include dealing with moldy books um, in, our circulating collection, in our circulating collection, a very small isolated leak in our special collections book stack, and a situation where uh, our visual arts building had, there's something wrong with our um, HVAC and the humidity was off the charts and damaged some art hanging on the, hanging on the walls. So a little bit about Union College. This is our iconic Knott Memorial. It sort of sets the tone for the campus. It's a historic campus, um, started in 1795, and we have many historic buildings on campus. Uh, that's the view out my window. Um, so we, we were the first, we, we like to claim we're the first planned campus. Um, our, our campus was, plan was created in 1813. Uh, we're not a we're not we're a small college. You can see only 221 faculty, 2,000 just a little over 2,000 students, and our risk manager um, has other jobs. You know, she's she's also in charge of the budget at Union and does many other things. But we do have a risk manager on campus. And if you don't know who that person is, where you work, I encourage you to find out and to set up a meeting with that person because you. You want to get to know them and have a have a good understanding of you know roles um, before you have you know a disaster situation on your hands. And <clears throat> I put this line in about imagining all the opportunities for things that can go wrong on a college campus. So the art and the artifacts and the books are kind of the least of their worries. <laughs> you know, uh, they're dealing with other kinds of issues like people getting hurt and you know all kinds of things. Um, so just to keep that in mind too, these are these are very busy people. Um, this is a picture of the Schaefer Library. Uh, the front, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the front of the building with the awning, that part of the building was built in 1961. And then the back of the building, you can see all the windows and the different color roof. That was built in 1998 and the whole building was renovated also in 1998. So it's a somewhat modern, uh, building. And again, Karen did a nice job of uh, saying everything that I'm in charge of, and I have some facts and figures so you get a sense of the size of our collections um, for special collections and archives and our permanent permanent collection, which includes art as well as scientific instruments. And our Adirondack Research Library has a historic house along, along with it. Um, Next. Um, so again, I mentioned that we are open, the building was open in 1961 and with a full renovation in 1998. And prior to 1961, we were in, the library was in the Knott Memorial, that building I showed on my slide. Um, so I got to Union in August of 2012 and I interviewed in the spring of 2012 and not one person, not one person mentioned that there was a mold problem in my interview. So, so I get to campus in August and we're encased in a mold outbreak. And I, my boss said, you know, Francis, honestly, I forgot to tell you because I thought we had it solved. And those of you who have worked with mold know how tricky mold can be. You do think you have it solved, but then when the conditions change again and make it right for mold to grow, guess what? Mold grows again. So that's what happened at, at, at um, at Union, they they thought in 20, 2011, they thought they had it under control. <clears throat> and then it came right back in the summer again. And one of the biggest issues, um, our facilities crew, who are very dedicated and wonderful people, they just could not wrap their brain around why. Why, since 1961, we've never had a mold problem. Nothing ever changed. We didn't do anything differently. And then all of a sudden, we're growing mold. I mean, that they just could not understand that. And it turns out it wasn't any one factor, it was a combination of many factors, including, you know, all the hurricanes that this area suffered in 2011 and 2012. We didn't have, you know, standing water in our basement, but it was damp um, and it was humid. Um, and our summers were also very hot. So it's just something to keep in mind that things can kind of creep up on you without you really realizing. 
So who are you going to call? You know, you've got this problem. Who are you going to call? Well, ironically, I didn't, I had just moved, right? I didn't know anybody. So I called a former colleague at Emory University who specialized in preservation. And he told me to call Karen Kilbreeze, <laughs> but she was on sabbatical. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, now what do I do? So we had a relationship already with the Northeast Document Conservation Center. Um, if you're not familiar with that organization, I highly recommend you take some time, just you know, spend an hour browsing their website. Uh, it's just chock-a-block full of information. You will learn everything you need to learn about mold and how it grows and what the conditions are and the appropriate levels for the heat and the humidity um, to prevent mold. Um, and they will take your phone calls and they will hold your hand and they were just absolutely 100% wonderful. Um, and then through talking to colleagues, who's again, I'm not shy about asking dumb questions, um, <clears throat> I found out that Vassar College nearby had a, a, had a major mold outbreak not long ago. So I called that director and she put me in, she gave me the name Polygon, which is an organization uh, company, I think they're in Boston, and they do mold mitigation. They also do any kind of disaster mitigation. So if you have a disaster like that first slide, they're the people to call. <clears throat> they came and got our books. They uh, for, they killed the mold. They cleaned the books, and then they stored them for us until we were ready um, to bring them back. Because once books get mold, they're very susceptible to get it again if you don't fix the uh, environmental conditions that created the mold problem in the first place. Polygon also did work with us to um, bring the humidity levels down in our library until we could figure out what the next steps were, how to solve this problem permanently. Um, interestingly, our insurance claim was denied. Uh, and the reason why it was denied is because all the factors relating to what caused the mold. It wasn't because something broke. It wasn't because we had a big leak and a flood. It was because, you know, we we had air conditioning, um, you know, during winter and summer, right? Air conditioning on in the summer and heat on in the winter, but then those shoulder months, right? So think about your own home. Do you have, you know, what do you do in April and May, right? Sometimes you turn the heat on, sometimes you turn the air conditioning on. And so at a, at a library like Union and where I worked at Hamilton College, there was nothing on. And so, you know, there's no HVAC on. And so that, that made the conditions ripe for growing mold. The other thing we discovered, um, once we, uh, the college agreed to put in a um, new HVAC system to have air conditioning 365 days a year and up north, um, it's expensive because you have to um, heat the air and heat the air in the in the in those shoulder months because it's too cold, and so it makes it very expensive up here to heat to have air conditioning on 365, unlike down south in Atlanta where I where I'd been before. So we were still after all that work it was like a million dollars to put in a new um, a new air conditioning unit. We were still growing mold on the second floor. And what we figured out it had to be is sunlight. So these are pictures of what it looks like. Again, this building was built in 1998. The sun just pours in. And in the middle picture, that's those windows on the second floor with the blinds down. And then on the far right is with the blinds up. And this time of day, um, those windows face directly east. The sun pours in and it's really, really hot. Um, I used to joke we could grow cannabis. You know, if we wanted a fourth revenue stream, that's where we could grow it. You know, it would get so incredibly hot there. And so we discovered that if we kept our blinds down, that would stabilize the temperature. And sure enough, once we did that, the mold, you know, we solved the mold problem. We weren't growing mold anymore. And what, when you learn about mold, what you will learn is it's the, it's the fluctuations in your environmental conditions that make it that make it ripe for problems um, with your print materials. So my next little smaller case disaster happened during COVID in August 2020 um, in our compact shelving and special collections. And our special collections facilities is top notch, state of the art, you know, very cold, air conditioned, good humidity, all that kind of thing. Um, and when the college shut down in March of 2020, 
we met with our campus safety because we weren't allowed on campus, if you recall, and our campus safety was. And so we had a meeting where we detailed exactly where we wanted campus safety to patrol daily to look for any kind of potential problems. So the story that I like to tell that gets people's attention is I had uh, friends who traveled and once they traveled like for three weeks and when they came back to their house, it was full of water. Their first floor was destroyed and their basement was destroyed. And the source of that water was the uh, water pipe in the refrigerator that creates ice. So that little water thing to the ice maker failed and filled their house full of water, destroying their first floor in their basement. And when I told that story to our head of campus safety, oh yeah, that could happen. And sure enough, it does. My sister went out to dinner. She was only gone for a couple hours, came home, same thing, the ice maker um, failed and um, they came home to a, a kitchen full of water. So it's amazing um, what water can do and how, how damaging it can be in a short period of time. Uh, we had little sensors, they didn't go off. And Sarah Schmidt, who's on the call, and if you have questions about this specifically, she's the one to answer. She found it by happenstance. She was, uh, when we were finally allowed in in the summer, she was writing a grant um, on getting some uh, manuscripts digitized that related to the books. And so she went back there and discovered the, the problem. So in these pictures, you can see the um, completely soaked ceiling tile. And you can see um, the ceiling tile uh, crumbled and disintegrated and adhered itself to some of the books. And that, oh, pardon me, how do I go back? Oh dear. And then the far right picture is some of the damage of the books actually you know, sticking to each other. And Sarah does have a background in conservation. So she, she knew what to do. She knew what she could fix herself and what she needed to uh, send out for a repair. Um, so again, who are you going to call? So here, imagine Sarah, she's in the library, sees this problem, and she knew what the protocol was. So she, and so again, if you don't know the protocol in your organization, you want to find out what that protocol is. So the first thing it is, you call, at Union, we call facilities to come and fix whatever's causing the link, the leak immediately. And then they fill out an incident report. They coordinate with risk management. They call campus safety and campus safety documents and write an incident report and that incident report goes to our risk manager who then um, hands it over to our uh, insurance broker. Um, <clears throat> and then the insurance broker reviews next steps um, with us. And what I would say, if you don't know um, your risk manager and if you've never talked to your insurance broker, you should do that. These people are in your corner they want to support you. They they don't want to claim. Um, that's what success looks like. No claim. And then if there is one, they want it to get processed, you know, quickly and smoothly. So get to know who those people are that you that you need to work with. And um, <clears throat> Sarah also called um, Northeast Document Conservation Center as well. Again, we have a a longstanding relationship with them as well. So if you don't have a longstanding relationship with someone who can repair books for you, you might want to set that up as well. Um, so the first steps that we had to do, that Sarah did, was document the loss. So she took pictures of all the damaged books. Um, she assessed what she, you know, what just needed to kind of dry out versus what needed conservation beyond what she could do. Create a spreadsheet of those items that were going to go off to NEDCC. And she had to come up with an estimated value while they were off site. Um, and then any DCC would come up with, you know, an invoice or a contract or an estimate. So it kind of didn't matter really to our insurance broker. They just wanted something in writing that documented, yes, this is what they were going to do. And this is what it, what it would cost. And this is how long it would take. Um, and then one of the back and forth was who was going to insure our books while they're any DC and, um, union had coverage already for that. So we, we paid for that. Um, so interestingly, uh, Sarah had to come up with a value while the books were at NEDC. Now our rare book collections have never been appraised. So she had to come up with a value 
based on current rare book market rates. So an average rare book, you know, cost this so times however many books she was sending out. That's that's how she did it. And then she added she she added to it. She she inflated the number um, to make sure that it was going to cover cover everything. And this is fine because we didn't really lose anything. The books just had water damage and could be repaired. However, without a good um, appraisal, if it's a loss, like a theft or something completely destroyed, you may not get fully compensated for that item if you don't have an up-to-date appraisal on that item. So uh, again, in my conversations with um, our insurance broker and our risk manager, I learned about appraisals. And I, what, what they will tell you is they should be kept up to date like every five years, get your materials reappraised. Now who can afford to do that? Not many of us. And what they recommend you do that we did um, is pick your top most valuable. And it depends on the size of your collection and how much money you have available to spend, um, how you do that. So they threw out numbers like, you know, anything over $100,000, um, your, top, your top 10, you know, they, they didn't care. They were just saying, you know, figure out what makes sense for you and what's, and what's affordable. And right before COVID, we were working, Sarah and I were working with um, finding people to, to appraise our collections. And then COVID came and shut all that down. So we still haven't appraised our collections yet, but it's, it's on the list of things to do. Um, our art collection has been appraised, but not any time recently. And so we, we, again, we were gonna, we were working on that and then COVID hit. So we have to go back to that. <clears throat> and the interesting thing, you know, there's value and then there's appraisal. So um, appraisals are market-based. So what, what, what people will look at is what's sold recently that's like this, condition and provenance. So for example, you know, Union has some really wonderful things in it that are rare, so rare that there's no market. So they're not valuable, but for the scholarly record, they are, they are critically important. So monetarily, they're not valued. They're, they're not that valuable. Um, and they can't like really be replaced because there's, there's only, there's not that many things out there like that. So that's part of insurance too, is, you know, how much do you put on value on it if it's something that, you know, you can never replace. Um, so we are also required, our insurance companies require that we give an inventory of all of our rare books and our art collection annually. Um, and we do that every year as well. Um, so, um, Ironically, you know, these, th this claim and then the art, we had an art claim in that same summer where we had some works on paper hung in our visual arts department building. And in the summer, something, something went haywire with the HVAC and the humidity was sky high and was so high that even though these things were framed, the, the water was absorbed into the artwork. So both claims were under $60,000. It wasn't a ton of money. But it prompted um, the insurance aid, this insurance company, to come visit Union College. We had been, we haven't been to your college in a long time. We want to come see. So, if you're worried about your insurance rates going up, it's things like claims that that do it. So it actually was a very helpful thing for us. We were um, in the library anyway. We were very excited about it. So Sarah Schmidt, myself, and Julie Lowe's, who's the um, curator of our uh, scientific instruments and art collections. We spent all day um, with a representative from Hartford Insurance and he wrote a lengthy report and these are pictures he included in the report. So what, what are the, the things that he told us to do immediately is you can see the art material uh, stored on the floor. Big no-no, why? The number one cause of claims, water. So if there's a leak, um, in the ceiling or the floor, it's gonna, if it's in the ceiling, it's gonna end up on the floor. So nothing should be on the floor. Um, uh, our key, this is our key management <laughs> or was our key management for special collections. You know, special collections was behind locked doors and security. So they didn't feel like they needed to have their keys locked up, but um, we were asked to get a key box and do a better job with our keys, which we did. And then the lower picture, those are pictures of our, um, lights in our offsite storage facility. Um, 
they have mercury in them and they can explode and shatter and rain um, uh, heated material on the books and cause a fire. So as soon as he walked into our storage facility and saw those lights, he stopped dead, got out his pen and paper and said, those have to go. And <clears throat> he actually put a time frame for the college to get rid of these lights. Um, our our uh, new contract is up July 1 and they wanted these lights re replaced by July 1. And, uh, and of course the college did do that. And now we have wonderful LED lights that work oh so much better than, than these lights. This storage facility was a, was built as a, a place to create, to build um, appliances. It was not built to, as a art or book storage facility. So that's why those lights were there. Okay. Um, so there's our, uh, just saying, you know, it was really helpful for us to have this, these people visiting us. Again, I'm back to your insurance people are your friends. They want to support you and protect you from loss. Um, so they um, they got wind that we were getting new shelving uh, to store our art collections, and they put it right in their report. Make sure you hire an art mover to move these move these art collections, which um, was great because it made it easier for me to make the case to hire an art mover. They're not cheap. Um, and then he had a long list of upgrades to our warehouse. None of these things have been done, but at least they're documented. And it's not just the librarians asking for them, right? It's, you know, you know we're being taken more seriously because it was our insurance um, company saying, you know, you, you, you really need to do these kinds of things to protect yourselves from loss. Um, so what in insurance carriers don't care about, right? So remember back our mold, we didn't, our, our claim was denied because nothing broke right? There is no catastrophic event that caused the mold. It was just our own way that we were keeping track of our conditions. It was us managing our own HVAC. Um, they also don't care about dust. Our storage facility is very dusty, and he did not bring that up at all. <clears throat> and dust is a killer. Dust can uh, damage your art and your books. It can uh, uh, discolor it, uh, mold loves to eat dust. It's it's a source of nutrition for mold. Dust is bad. Um, and when we had um, the art movers come, they're coming. They're coming to actually pack up and move the art this summer. But they came to do a a, a pre a pre meeting to get 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 us a good estimate. That's all she could talk about is our dust and things that she recommended that we do to mitigate the dust at our storage facility. And we're working through some of those recommendations. Um, even to the point where she's saying, get some Tyvek uh, sheeting to cover your stacks to keep the dust away from your collections. The other killer um, is light, both from you know your 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 the lights in your building, but also sunlight. Um, we have had some artwork just get completely uh, faded, so not destroyed, but ruined. Um, you know, it's still, we still have it, but we don't show it because it's just looks terrible. It's so completely faded out. And I really didn't understand how faded it was until I went to UAlbany and they had um, similar prints in the same series by the same artist. And uh, what was on the wall there were um, vibrant oranges and deep um, browns where our work was like so faded, you could barely tell it was orange. Um, so you really have to watch for how you are displaying um, anything and for how long. So we're very careful about um, some of our collections and how long we put them out in display cases and what the lighting is. Um, just just to make sure that we don't inadvertently create factors that that harm our artwork that we can't then go to the insurance agency and say, oh, you know, now we want you to fix this for us. So um, Karen did talk about um, Cap New York FAR, FAR, F, F, A, F, R. Now they were founded in 2015 and I came and had the mold problem in 2012. And boy, this would have been a helpful organization to me um, back, back then. And this is just um, one of the uh, pages from their website that lists all the different resources they have available. 
And um, I actually attended the training and webinar, the AIC one on fire protection strategies for collections and museums. That's still available online. And his, he's, the, the man is in charge of facilities at the Smithsonian. And his whole point was to get people like us to be comfortable with sprinklers in our facilities because too many of us are afraid of water sprinklers in our facilities. And his, you know, the route that they would ruin our books um, with the sprinklers went off. And his whole point is these are very targeted. If you don't have sprinklers, by the time the fire department comes, they can even be around the corner, it could be 20 minutes, and they're going to come in with their big hoses and spray water all over your collections, where if you had sprinklers, it would be just a very targeted area and they would go off immediately. Um, so just really good common sense, but it's nice to have someone like that in your corner when you talk to facilities and they're poo-pooing, oh, we don't need sprinklers, or, you know, we have, a, we have a fire department right around the corner, which we do in Schenectady. But again, it, the damage is incomparable. So I highly recommend uh, spending time on this, this website. Um, and then again, um, AFR has, who are you gonna call? They have, they have great list of numbers of when you have a problem of, of who to call here. Uh, we use Williamstown Art Conservation for art. We have a, a, a contract with them and we have things there all the time getting either cleaned or repaired or, you know, you name it, something's happening with them. Um, the Document Heritage Program there on the bottom, they also do um, things where they, you can write a, write a proposal to have them come, they call them grants, um, where they will come for free and come to your facility and write up an assessment report for you on what you can do to improve your facilities to protect your collections. And so we did have them come to Union College and look at our special collections area and look at our warehouse. And they had a big long list of recommendations, things that we should be doing. And I used that as my roadmap for improving our storage facility which led me to, to, to spend the money to get better, better shelving, which then protected me when the insurance agent came and said, you've got all this stuff on the floor. I'm like, well, I'm, I've ordered shelving, it's coming. <laughs> so we're gonna put it on the shelves. Okay, good. So um, if you haven't had um, a preservation assessment done for your facilities, I highly recommend that. It can be a bit overwhelming because there's so much that we could be doing to better to protect our work, our, our, our facilities, but at least it gives you a roadmap of, of where to start and how to prioritize. And then documenting, again, that it's not just you, it's other people saying that this is important. So that's it. Here's my contact information. And I think it's time for Q&As. And I can stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Francis. That was amazing. Um, and I'm sorry for all your bad luck. What a crummy way to start a new job. Um, I, um, so I'm inviting you all to ask questions. You can either put them into the chat. There's a couple of us here who will be monitoring that. Um, or you can unmute yourself. You could raise your hand. Uh, if you'd like to, you can go down into the, um, reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you click on that, you'll see a raise hand bar. It's like, Underneath the little emojis, there's a bar that says raise hand. Um, but um, so I'll give you guys a chance to, to think about what might be on your minds. We'll tap Frances while we, we've got her expertise here to share. I wanted to know a little bit about your mold <coughs> infestation. And if you could um, tell us the extent of the, the, the infestation and um, how long it took you to get the books back on the shelf. Yeah, so it wasn't huge. It was about 12,000 items. Um, and you know, my st the, the staff was on top of it. They, they you know, pulled everything. Uh, so when Polygon came, they were able to get, get them all off site. Um, th what, it didn't take Polygon long to clean them and get them back to us. The problem was the college figuring out what the permanent solution was and that you know it was expensive. It was a million dollars to put in a, a new store, a new HVAC system in the library. I mean, that's 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 a lot of money. 
So um, it took a little while for, for the college to work through that issue and decide to do it and make sure that was really going to work um, and then install it and that whole nine yards. So I don't actually remember how long all of that took. And then as a precaution, we, um, we put all the, we call them the polygon books and we didn't put them back in um, Schaefer library. We put them in our storage facility because that did have um, uh, HVAC and humidity control uh, 365. And so we put them there until we could figure out um, and make sure that the conditions at Schaefer were, were stable. And I'm glad we did that because as I said, you know, even after the million dollars in the new HVAC, we were still having mold because of all that sunlight coming in and fluctuating um, the temperature. So I'm going to say maybe a year, maybe a year all told. Uh, so that's so um, the fact that you were able to bring them back to campus meant you could also loan them to patrons for these circulating books. Right. Okay. That's right. Good. Um, so we have a question in the chat for you from Donna. She asks, did you have a report, did you have to report back to the insurance company on the items you had rectified? Um, that, I think that's a question for Sarah Schmidt. Sarah, did you have to do anything to like close out the deal to show, yes, it's all done, they're back, they're repaired? I did. I had to, um, well, any, any DCC documented the conservation process really well. And um, I, as I recall, I submitted um, the invoice for the completion of the work. Uh, and that, that's what uh, the insurance company asked for. And that, but that was all I needed to do. On you guys, I know you've got questions. So I'm glad that you mentioned about um, the importance of you know working with your insurance company. Uh, and I'm going to just circle back a little bit to the CAP New York AFR. You know, our mission is to connect first responders uh, in your communities with the cultural organizations. Um, and as, as important as it is, you know, to, you know, get to know your insurance brokers, it's also really important to find out who your county emergency managers are. Um, they can also provide a tremendous amount of information about uh, what you can, they'll walk around your facility, they've got time, they will come, they will visit, they will walk around, they will look at your site, they'll look at, you know, they may not look at collections areas with the same eye that 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 we've learned how to do as conservators have, um, but they they can provide a tremendous amount of information. and And I know in the past some people have been afraid. You know, they don't want to call the fire chief in to to give them advice and ideas because um, they're afraid they're going to be cited and ticketed. Um, that's not usually the case. Usually, what they want to do is really come in first and understand where your precious materials are, understand what your issues are, provide you with the advice that you need, makes their job easier and helps you in the long run too. So that was a really nice point that you made. Yeah, and at Union, and I'm sure this is true at other colleges, our campus safety is the liaison to all the first responders. <clears throat> and they have a very strong relationship with the fire department and the police and the whole, you know, everybody in Schenectady, they work very closely together. <clears throat> well, I don't see any other questions. I don't see any raised hands. So, um, oh, we do have a question from Allison. Um, the head of our department wants to move our archive into storage. What sorts, what sort of things should I let him know we need to consider? So. Department head wants to move the archive into storage. Any comments or suggestions for Allison? So um, I would say there's a couple of things there. What does storage mean? And you know, what have you had your storage area assessed by you know a Dipsney or by a by by an expert who can say yes, you've got the right. Um, 
humidity levels and uh, temperature levels? You know, is, is it a good place to store your material? Um, and so once you've gotten that established that yes, it is a safe place to put your collections, um, then how are you actually gonna move it? I think is also an important thing um, that you don't you know, damage the collections as you move them and to be thoughtful about how you actually do that. So, you know, we knew we couldn't move our art collection, for example. So we knew we needed to um, bring in a consultant to help us figure out how to do that. Um, but I would imagine we would think that we could move our <laughs> archives in rare books, but there probably are some things to keep in mind that we wouldn't necessarily think about. You know, what if it's raining? Or, um, you know, what, how do you, how, what's the best way to transport these items so that they don't get um, ruined in the process? So to think carefully about how, how that, actually how that move is gonna actually happen. Thank you, um, Francis. Marietta asks, oh, sorry, I have to move my cursor up a little bit. She asks, did you update your emergency plan or documentation as a result of the recent mold or water issues? Good question. So um, Sarah worked with our campus safety and uh, Sarah, I don't know if you wanna hop in here and cause she demonstrated for me. She said, now they're supposed to stand on a step stool and look on top of <laughs> our, our um, compact shelving to see if there's any, any leaks up there. You know, cause they patrol all the time through our facility, but no, they're not gonna open every, Every, every compact shelf and look down the aisle. But if they stood on, stood on something high enough so that they could see on top, <clears throat> then, then, that, then that would catch it. Um, so the mold, I would say the mold issue, you know, really it wasn't a, an emergency, right? It was just something that happened slowly over time. And then the environment just got ripe with, you know, the wet, hot, wet summers of 2011 and 2012 that created this mold bloom. So, and it, so it really wasn't an emergency or a disaster, right? So that's what, that's what's challenging about that. So um, it was, it was a different mold is a kind of a different situation than, than, a, than like a flood, you know, or, um, you know, or, or, you know, or, or, or a tree falling on your building, you know, it's one of those kinds of disasters that gets everybody's attention where mold, you know, it, it could be in your libraries and you don't even know it's there, you know, and so to keep, keep an eye on your collections that way. <clears throat> if I can just chime in, Francis, um, I'll, I'll say that Marietta, yes, we've, I've been in the process of updating or really kind of, yeah, creating for the library, a disaster response plan. And last year I was able to take a class that CAP AFR offered and I think those videos are on the website so you can kind of follow along and it's incredibly helpful uh, to break down what should go into a disaster plan into manageable chunks. Um, I got stalled out because we've like so many places we've had some retirements and turnovers in facilities and security and the partners on campus that we need to have but um, those are gradually being filled and, and I should get back to it. But I was already planning to do this because nowhere did we account for the building being empty for three months because of a global pandemic. Uh, and so we wanted to kind of add that in. And as Francis said, um, security, when they do their patrols are supposed to stand on a, on a small ladder and look down the top of the, uh, compact shelving. Yeah, and the, 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 the insurance agent wanted the college to invest in water sensors on the floor. So the water bugs Sarah has are up in the ceiling tiles. And he, he wanted us to, he wanted the college to invest in water, water sensors on the floor. And when our head of facilities saw that, he said, that is outrageously expensive. Um, he was not interested in doing that. It, it just was mind boggling to him how that could really work and be affordable. So, but that's really what he 
what the insurance agent said to do. Because again, the number one cause of claims is, is water, is from water. And it ends up on the floor. <laughs> it may start in your ceiling, but it ends up on the floor. So and that was that was so interesting to me because as he pointed out, fire fire protection is regulated and water is not. And so every time uh, facilities inspects our, our fire our fire extinguishers every month, I think really all the pipes above the ceiling should get that same kind of inspection. Right. Yeah, because the leak, Sarah, was just a little screw, right? Something failed. It was, it was a bolt that fa failed. It was over a drip pan. The drip pan overflowed. The ceiling tile absorbed it, began to um, disintegrate. And ceiling tiles act like concrete when they get wet and then dry again. Those books that Francis showed the picture of, they were fused together. Um, it, yeah, it was messy. Um, I wanted to uh, comment on the water alarms. Um, there are little local audible alarms that you can buy that you can set up and they've just got a, a contact to, you know, a positive and a negative and the water bridges the gap between them and alarm goes off and they're very, very loud. Um, they're only really good if somebody's around to hear them and knows what it is. Right. Um, and I think one of the reasons they're really loud is not so people can just so people can hear it from really far away, but if they're nearby, it's so loud, it's actually really irritating and they're going to go investigate. So those are very affordable. They, they run like $12, $20, and you can put them everywhere, but you need to have a patrol that right. is paying attention. You could also, if you've got any kind of online data logger set up, there are um, uh, water alarms that you can install on those, usually multiple lines, but they're like hardwired to the data loggers. The little sensors can sit either on the top or on the floor, uh, but they have to be within, I don't know, I think it's like 300 feet of the dad logger itself. But that's another option. It's not as expensive as some of the, some of the in, in floor systems that are often put in during construction in special areas where, you know, there's computer equipment or museum collections. Um, okay. so. Yeah, after, after our mold outbreak, we bought data loggers for our um, circulating collection and they, someone took them. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. we're, we're, I, I, so they, they, they don't, we don't have them anymore. Somebody, you know, someone thought they were kind of fun and took them. Yeah, we had our water alarm stolen as well. I'm not sure that the students even were, I won't say students, that's me, but whoever took them probably didn't really know what they were. Yeah. Um, we were using data loggers that were like little boxes and we had to go upload the data with USB drives. Um, and those we strapped down to the stacks sort of a little bit out of sight so they wouldn't get picked up. Um, the ones that we've just installed recently are from a company called Anixter, A-N-I-X-T-E-R, and we are putting them in locations that are either difficult to access or we're we're bolting them down so that they can't be picked up. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Things can disappear. I know that um, Vassar College years ago, I was down doing a survey and they had problems with stealing light bulbs. Students were stealing light bulbs because they could reach them. Um, so when they went to go over to LEDs, you know, that was really complicated because LEDs at the time were already, were still really expensive and they didn't want to do it because they didn't, they thought they would just disappear. So I, that's funny you mention it, Francis, because it's always, you just have to keep those things in the back of your mind. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the other, I just dawned on me, one of the other, um, things that <clears throat> is a danger to your collection that, um, you know, you probably wouldn't get, maybe you would get covered by insurance are pests. So at our storage facility, we do have, um, we do have a pest problem and we're going to have to look at a uh, management program for our pests. Uh, we, uh, when we, when we did, a, when we got the new shelving in, we shifted our archival storage our archival boxes onto the new shelves. And, you know, we found carcasses of uh, birds and mice, as well as, you know, different kinds of bugs. And, you know, that, those kinds of pests can do damage to your collections as well, as we know. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, sounds like a good idea for a fall program for, yeah. for us. Yeah. So, thank you. Does anybody have any last questions, comments that they'd like to make before we wrap up? I'm watching the chat. I don't see anything. Okay. Again, my thanks to everyone for joining us today with special thanks, of course, to our presenter, Francis Malloy. I'd also like to thank those who assisted with organizing our program today. Thank you to the Capital District Library Council and the other members of the CAP New York AFR board. Um, as I said, the recording should be available sometime next week. That will be available through the Capital District Library Council, and I will send you all an email with the link. Uh, again, thank you, Francis. Everyone, have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.